One of my favorite stories from our, our wedding two years ago was, our big rule was we only did Iowa grown food and only pasture meat and dairy. And my mom's one of 12, big Irish Catholic. And I couldn't get over how much, how many of my Iowa family members couldn't get over how good our pork was because we had pasture pork. And it's just like, they, they were so used to industrial pork chops and that stuff just, isn't, just doesn't taste good. That's Austin Frerich. I had a great conversation with him, which you will be hearing on today's show. He's talking about his new book, Barons, which is about the robber barons of today's food system. This is Down to Earth, the Planet to Plate podcast co-produced by the Radio Cafe and the Kefira Coalition. I'm your host, Mary Charlotte Domandi. We'll be back right after this quick announcement. Kivira Coalition, American Grass-Fed Association, and Holistic Management International are excited to announce this year's Regenerate Conference. Save the date, November 6th through 8th in Denver, Colorado. This year's conference, Innovating for a Resilient Future, will interrogate and explore data, technology, information collection and sharing, ways of learning and knowing, and the myriad approaches to fulfilling our ecological roles. Go to regenerateconference.com to sign up for the mailing list to be notified when registration opens. And now to our program. I'd like now to welcome Austin Frerich. He's an expert on agricultural and antitrust policy. He's a fellow of the Thurman Arnold Project at Yale University, and he's author of a fantastic new book. It's called Barons, Money, Power, and the Corruption of America's Food Industry, published by Island Press. Just came out. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me on. So tell us about the title of this book, Barons. You're basically comparing today's food industry captains to the robber barons of the 19th and early 20th centuries. Yeah, so that's that's what I'm hearkening back to because I just see so many parallels to this moment in time. To me, I think we're living in another second, a second gilded age where a few people control vast swaths of industry can really shape industries. And so I thought using this barren framework was a really fascinating way to talk about bigger things going on in the food system. You've got seven chapters about seven barons in the sectors of hogs, grain, coffee, dairy, berries, animal slaughter, and groceries. And apparently there's some other barons that didn't quite make the cut, like egg barons and potato barons. But let's start with hogs. You're a seventh generation Iowan, and in your own lifetime, you've really seen some huge changes in Iowa, specifically because of the power of this hog baron family. Tell us that story. Yeah, I mean, it's such a simple little thing, um, Mary Charlotte, where, like, you know, driving in Iowa, going on vacation, you used just seeing animals, you would just see animals. You know, you would see hogs, you see cows. Uh, we would always go up to the Wisconsin Dells growing up, and you'd drive through northeast Iowa, which was dairy country. And slowly, they just started disappearing. And, you know, it doesn't happen overnight. First, hogs went indoors. They went into these massive metal sheds called confinements, CAFOs. And then slowly, dairy cow disappeared too. Now, all we have left are beef cattle on the land, and those are starting to disappear too. And Iowa used to be a state, I mean, it's got such incredibly fertile land. I mean, it's a perfect agricultural state. And you write about the fact that Iowa, different regions were known for different foods like fruit or onions or whatever. Yeah, I mean, first of all, I, I encourage your listeners to whatever state they live in. The WPA under the New Deal wrote these fantastic state guides of every state in the country. And they're part travel guides, but also part kind of encyclopedias. Every state has a section on their agriculture section in the 1930s. And that's where I discovered all this rich history of regional food production in Iowa. But even in my lifetime, like we used to have a lot of apple orchards where I grew up and those are all gone. And it's not like the apple orchards were yanked out to put in suburban homes. They were yanked out to put in corn. That goes to my, my point on the, the grain barren. The, the farm bill now is, is designed to overproduce grains at the expense of everything else. And for Iowa, I mean, as the animals disappeared, that means these the rural communities in Iowa hollowed out. What used to be a bunch of family farms doing hogs now is my hog barren. My hog barren does 5 million hogs a year. And so... Not only is one man concentrating all this power, getting all these gains, what used to be independent farmers are now low wage workers for him. And he doesn't even live in rural Iowa anymore. He lives in the only gated community in uh, suburban Des Moines, and he spends half his time in Florida. So who is he and how did he go from being a small hog farmer to this basically uh, multi-billionaire? Yeah, so his name is Jeff Hansen and he's married to Deb Hansen. 
he started his, so he was just a normal family farmer, you know, taking on the family operation. But what he saw was the emergence of industrial hog facilities in North Carolina. So for a little context for your listeners, back a century ago, when we wrote all these regulations to maintain competitive markets for the meat markets after, in response to the jungle and all that kind of stuff, Americans didn't really eat a lot of chicken. There was no chicken slaughterhouses. You know, basically you grew chickens in your backyard and you butchered it. So when they wrote these regulations, chicken wasn't included. So what happened in the South, taking that model of sharecropping, a few farmers or corporations in the South applied it to chicken production. So if you're a chicken farmer in the South, you don't actually even own your bird. You're leased the bird. It's incredibly exploited a model. But because of that, chicken gained massive market share for the last few decades. Because, you know, it's cutting all these corners, really squeezing labor, really squeezing farmers. And instead of making chicken behave like the other proteins, USDA allowed a race to the bottom. So what happened in North Carolina was North Carolina copied this model of chicken production, um, where the farmer's no longer a farmer, they're just a contract grower, and they did it in the poor black areas of North Carolina. So my hog baron saw what was going on in North Carolina and goes, that's the future, and let me get on that. So he started building these industrial facilities. At the same time, you had the business elite of Iowa commission a report basically saying, we want to maintain our number one status in hogs because North Carolina is catching up to us because we want to sell seed, we want to sell feet, you know, all that kind of stuff. And they're willing to basically forego the family farm. I mean, this was, to me, when I started this project, you know, you kind of assume it's, oh, they had the best technology, efficiency, yada, yada. And you realize, no, 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 how intentional this all was. And then my hog baron, not only was he a first mover, but the thing to keep in mind with these barons is that they're usually, they're willing to cross lines other people aren't willing to cross. Most, most farmers weren't willing to put their animals in such a confined space. Because they have some concern for animal welfare. Many of them, most farmers, I think, really love their animals. Yeah, animal welfare, I mean, even their community. I mean, these things are, a hog defecates three times more than a human being. So if you have a facility of 2,000 hogs, that's the manure of 6,000 people. That just destroys the quality of life, animal welfare. I mean, it's, it's an incredibly destructive model. One of the things that you write about is that people can't go swimming in lakes anymore. The water is too toxic. Yeah, in, in Iowa, and it's one of those things where actually it was my husband that first pointed it out to me because it, it happens slowly. But I mean, I was now at the point where in the summer, two thirds of the bodies of water in Iowa, you just can't go into. They're too polluted. You know, the beaches are closed, what have you. This didn't happen overnight. It was, I remember growing up, you know, it was a beach here or there. They put out advisory, but now it's just, it's so rampant because, I mean, Iowa has about 25 million hogs now. So that's about the manure of 75 million people. I mean, we're talking the population of California and Texas and that regulatory system is, it's captured by my hog baron. It, it's basically collapsed. So it's a free for all. I mean, there was just a story the other day where some facility was abandoned and this manure of like 5,000 hogs has just been sitting there slowly leaking. And who pays for the cleanup? I mean, I think you wrote that Des Moines pays something like $10,000 a day to treat the water. Who's paying for that? I mean, we all are. I mean, you have urban Iowa's paying for it for the, you know, the, the water quality. Rural Iowans are paying for it with their high cost. The, the, the well water is incredibly toxic and polluted. To, I mean, even look at the, the dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico. I mean, it, it's one of those things where all the cost is being passed on, on to us for his personal gain. On top of it, I mean, the thing, an undervalued thing, I think, in this moment is the collapse in taste. Like, the hogs don't taste that good in that model. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, a hog that runs around, it's going to taste way better than a hog that sits, stands still all day in a metal shed eating corn. I think we all pay for We all pay for this really selfish, greedy model. Except for the people who are actually benefiting from it. Yeah, the few, the, the few barons are able to capture the system for their personal gain at our expense. So when you say that it was intentional, just walk us through this process. And we won't go through all the barons, but I think in hogs, it's important to understand how it got from, I mean, these folks, the Hansons graduated from high school in 1976. I don't know about you, but that's within my lifetime. And here we are in a state where Iowa has been so thoroughly transformed that I mean, people don't want to move there. Children don't want to go into their parents' professions. The water, the air, the ecology, the rural communities are all suffering terribly. 
what were the steps that went from A to B? The big one was the loss of local control. So imagine you work your whole life, you save up, you build a house out in the country. All of a sudden, one, some, a neighbor announces they want to put up one of these industrial facilities for 2,000 hogs. At first, you could um, contest that. You can go to your local county board of supervisors and contest it. My hog baron in, the, in Big Ag didn't like this. So they passed legislation in Iowa in the 90s. And keep in mind, this was very big news in Iowa. This is front page news all the time in the Des Moines Register. It was part of the 1992 caucus campaign. Like Pat Buchanan ran against these facilities. They went to the state legislature and they passed, they ran through the legislation that basically stripped up local control. Where basically now only the governor of Iowa can stop the construction of a confinement. Keep in mind, Secretary Vilsack was a state senator at this time and he voted in support of stripping local control, this legislation. And then what you saw, once local control was gone, you saw a massive expansion of confinements in Iowa to the point where in 2002, it was actually the big issue in Secretary Vilsack's, uh, he was governor at the time, it was his re-election campaign. It was the big issue in Iowa. I mean, you had small towns in Iowa being filled with gyms, people wanting the repeal of that law. They wanted something done. They, they just saw that, you know, their quality of life deteriorate and the rural community suffer because of this. And Vilsack, he actually ran against the head lobbyist for my hog bear and he promised to do something. And after Secretary Vilsack won, Vilsack oversaw the largest expansion of CAFOs in Iowa history. And now he's the secretary of the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Yeah, I mean, my dark joke with Secretary Vilsack is he oversaw the death of the hog family farmer as governor of Iowa, and then he oversaw the death of the dairy family farmer as secretary of agriculture. Yeah. I mean, the classic playbook throughout this whole time, too, I should say, is you'll see supporters of industry always say, oh, let's just let's study it. Let's see how things shake out. You know, we have def- we can have different models and that's all just a lie because basically these aren't level playing fields. When you're cutting all these corners, people like my parent have an unfair price advantage. So they're going to gobble a bunch of market share. And what we saw with hogs, especially in the late 90s, is the price collapse. There was an oversupply. They had too much hog coming onto the market. And then all these family farmers exited the business. It just it wasn't worth it anymore. So, and, you know, as we know, and this is something that we've talked about on this show and that pretty much everybody is is aware of, is you've got these multiple situations going on at the same time, which is small businesses shut down as big businesses take hold. Small communities are hollowed out when there are fewer and fewer farms and families there. The jobs in these animal factories, essentially, are terrible jobs and and toxic and sometimes dangerous jobs. And, you know, the food, as you say, not only doesn't taste good, but there are issues with the overuse of antibiotics and so on and so on. That's the situation that we have now. And that's repeated in all these other industries as well. Yeah, it, it's you're seeing a copy and paste of this production model. I mean, I talk about how Driscoll's, Driscoll's is my berry baron. They sell one in three berries but they don't grow a single berry. <laughs> they took that model from chicken that comes from chair cropping and applied it where they own the genetics of the berry, but they don't actually grow the berry because that's the hardest part. So basically what we've seen in berry production is it's moved offshore where you can then basically evade environmental regulations and squeeze labor. And then dress schools can be like, oh, we didn't know this was going on. It's that veil of ignorance that allows them. But it's also to your point of big baguettes big. I mean, Driscoll's, The brothers that um, led it for the longest time straight up said part of the reason why they became berry barons is they saw the the coming of Walmart. I mean, they realized Walmart wants one company to do four berries year round at all 4,000 stores. I think it's really important to talk about the language that we use to describe economics. So the framing that a lot of people are used to is competitive free market capitalism on the one hand versus socialism or planned economies on the other hand. But what I got from your work is that the real dichotomy is between competitive free market capitalism on the one hand and corporate monopolies. In other words, a level playing field of many sort of small to medium sized businesses and these monopolistic big businesses that eat up all the small ones and actually destroy competition. But those things are sold, you know, the mainstream does not help us to understand that monopolism and free markets are opposed to each other. I'm so glad you asked that. 
I mean, two points on that. Number one, I don't know why we don't talk about this more, but I had such an aha moment a few years ago where I've been very fortunate in my job too. I was able to sit on in on a business school class at Yale's business school and it just dawned on me, oh, the goal of every corporation, every corporate CEO is monopoly. <laughs> monopoly are where profits are. Competitive markets are ruthless. Every day you're waking up, how do you beat your neighbor? So you have this inherent tension where government wants competitive markets. It's good for farmers, it's good for innovation, it's good for workers, and business doesn't. Their goal is not the destruction of competitive markets. Uh, you also said something earlier that I want to touch on about language. It took me a while researching this book to it really dawned on me how much, so much of the language of this era we're in is anti-democratic. It's designed to keep you out. It's incredibly um, technocratic. My favorite little things are like CAFO. I, I don't usually, I try to avoid using the word CAFO because it's an acronym. It means nothing. Confined animal feeding operations. Is that what it is? Yep. Yeah. Yep. That's what it is. That's what they call those industrial facilities. I like to use more aggressive language, like they're metal sheds, just because that's what, call it, like that's what it is. Yeah. Even like H2As, that's uh, a certain type of visa in the agriculture world. I just call that indentured servitude because that's what it is. And so I, I just like think that's such an underappreciated point of this era of just how much hollow language there is by design. It's, it's designed to kind of wall off the conversation. Let's talk for another moment about monopoly. I mean, monopoly, mono, mono, if you look at the definition, is basically one company that controls the whole market. But the way you're talking about monopolies, it's not necessarily one company, but it's one or two or a few companies that have so much of the market share that they act as a monopoly. Yeah, I, I define monopoly in a broad sense of like market shapers. All my barons, I believe, have the power to shape the markets that they are in because of the power they wield. One of the things that's interesting about monopoly, I mean, there's so there's so many monopolies. I mean, we're a country of monopolies, and you name some of the other ones. But I think it's particularly dangerous when you're talking about food, which is based in ecosystem. You see, I mean, yes, there's an eyeglasses and contact lenses monopoly, but somehow, and I'm sure that if we got into that, there'd be some terrible things, but I'm just not as, like, I don't really care if there's just standardization in eyeglasses as much as I care that, for example, these berries are grown in such a way that they're supposed to be standardized, all the same size, all perfect. And ecosystems aren't like that. Life isn't like that. And the result of that is tremendous problems for not only the earth, but for the people picking the berries. Oh, totally. I mean, I think this is especially concerning with meat and dairy production because you're, you're dealing with another, you're dealing with an animal. I mean, I, I was fortunate, you know, I've been working on this book for five years and I was fortunate to visit a lot of farmers, a lot of people doing it right. And what you quickly realize when you visit these operations is the relationship they have with their animals. You know, when you have a 50 cow herd, you know the personality of all the cows. <laughs> When you have a 35,000 dairy cow operation, they're just a number in an Excel sheet. You lose that humanity, you lose that, that care. It just devoids everything. To me, so much of this era too is, it devoids us of humanity and our sense of being. I talk about that in my coffee chapter a little bit. My mom used to have a bakery. I mean, in the day, no, no coffee is native to Iowa. Yeah, right. <laughs> a coffee bean's a coffee bean. But people came to my mom's store because of the relationship she built with them, the sense of community, the sense of place. That's gone in this era. My mom we ended up closing the bakery. My mom ended up working at a Starbucks inside of Target for 10 years. And not only does that just, it's not the same, but it's also like they don't even, as a worker, they don't trust you. Something simple as I'll never forget. Anytime you walk into a store like that, they called planograms. They tell you exactly what to put where, where they didn't even trust my mom as an adult professional. Like they didn't trust her to know her community. Someone in Seattle told her, this is how you should arrange things. This is how you should sell it. Not knowing that, like, for example, where my mom's store was, that's right next to a General Mills plant. A lot of people go there for during their third shift to get coffee. There's a certain kind of needs. I use this little example in my mom's store to talk about that bigger thing of it's just loss. I mean, every region is slightly different in America for its production. Um, there used to be a regionalness even to dairy production. I mean, you'd always get a lot more milk production in the spring with the summer. Well, that's all gone when these, when these cows live in a, basically the Truman Show. The Truman Show reference to this... What was it, a 90s movie with Jim Carrey, which is just surreal and fascinating. Not sure everyone's seen it, but... 
No, no, thank you for qualifying that. Uh, I just saw it for the first time. That's why I'm like really obsessed with it. It's where every day is the same day. He doesn't realize he's living in a reality show. But I, I thought about that um, when I toured an industrial dairy facility where I realized, oh, these cows will never see a blade of grass. It's just like every day is just kind of copy paste. It's Groundhog Day. I mean, it's profoundly sad. And I was also touring it with a group of um, younger children. And you just realize these kids will never know what it's like to drive and see cows on pasture. Yeah. Well, and that's something that, you know, there are people who are vegetarians or vegan because of animal welfare. But there's a piece that's lost in that conversation, which is that people who really love their animals, yes, they do get slaughtered. But as one of our guests once said, it's one bad day after a great lifetime. Yes. And that, that's what I think about all the time is we ended up taking their life from them or their milk, but we give so much more. And this model breaks that relationship. Yeah. I mean, anyone that's interacted with a pig knows how smart they are. And to put them inside these metal sheds all day, it's just, it's cruel. It's an incredibly cruel way to, you're just stripping them. They're a widget. Everything's a widget anymore. Yeah. And I think that, that philosophy, that, that economic philosophy is both lazy and very destructive to our sense of who we are in living. And it's ultimately so destructive to the planet, to the air, to the ground, to the water, to the microbes, because, I mean, there are things that really do lend themselves very nicely to a factory model, like computer manufacturing, things like that. But life really is not, it doesn't work that way. It's a complex system, and we're trying to put simple mechanistic mindset onto it and it just doesn't work it's going to break it is and like it's um i actually have always viewed it as a very lazy way to do things it's like trying to run a restaurant through an excel sheet there's something about getting your hands dirty and understanding the ins and outs of things what people really care about it's just it's a better run business i was just talking with someone earlier where so my coffee baron they entered the american coffee markets 10 years ago they now sell more coffee than starbucks but no one's ever usually heard of them um they're secret german family but they own brands you've heard of, like Keurig Cups or Panera. And I was saying how Panera's not what it used to be. I remember when the first Panera came to my hometown, and now you go into it, it feels like 2004 America. You know, what do you they're mean? They're just kind of... So the, the, my secret German family, they're, they're private equity. They rolled up the coffee industry. And basically what private equity does is it... I call them vultures. They strip out money. They don't put money into things. They strip out the assets. So if you go into a Panera now, they stop reinvesting. It just kind of everything inside feels dated, kind of feels sterile. I mean, you kind of see that a lot in America. And that to me is they're not building businesses. They're just strip mining assets, squeezing as much as they can out of it. Yeah. It's important to talk about policy because, as you were talking about earlier with, for example, the loss of local control, you know, policy is at the root of a lot of the problems that we have in agriculture today and in monopolistic capitalism in general. But, you know, talking about agriculture, you wrote about the fact that previous eras in agricultural policy have focused on balancing, like balancing the needs of food producers to make a living, the needs of consumers to eat food, the needs of the land to be conserved and be sustainable so that we can keep growing food, stuff like that. It seems like that should be a no-brainer to balance these different interests. And yet it seems like where we've gotten to is that, you know, these interests, all of which are important, are pitted against each other in some kind of like eternal battle to the death where one wins (laughs) and, and the other loses. What has balanced policy looked like in the past? Yeah, I mean... I really go back to the notion that a market is like a garden. It has to be cultivated and maintained. If you don't cultivate and maintain a garden, some invasive species comes along and takes over everything. That's kind of where we are. What's interesting about that question is we still have a few examples of these kind of managed markets in America. Cranberries are actually in that model of production, and so are sugar beets. But generally speaking, we move to a farm bill system, a food system where we put massive subsidies into overproducing a few things at the expense of everything else. So if you want to grow, if you want to grow grains, there's tons of government assistance. But if you want to grow carrots, good luck on that one. Which makes for the situation that we're in now, where we've got a whole lot of grain-based, highly processed food that isn't very good for you. 
and people aren't eating enough produce. You call this the Wall Street Farm Bill, and that is based in grain, much of which goes not even to make food for us, but to feed livestock. How did it get that way? What was the Farm Bill supposed to be originally? What is it now? Yeah, so the way, keep in mind, the, the, for your listeners, a Farm Bill is renewed every five to seven years. I focus in on two. The original one, what I call the New Deal Farm Bill, and where I, what I call the 1996 one, the Wall Street one. And I try to show where the New Deal Farm Bill is really rooted in figuring out ecological balance, of producing enough so people can eat, but also like so farmers can get a decent price and you know producers can make some money. And part of that, you know, that comes out of the Dust Bowl, where we saw where farmers were over, they were pushing their land, overproducing because the margin, the prices were so low, they were just trying to keep their land, so they're trying to squeeze as much out of it, which only made the ecological disaster even worse. Long story short, this farm bill model comes along where it tries to like tie together both, you can get money for conservation or you can get money for crop subsidies, but you have to engage in these conservation practices. So we're both trying to stabilize your income, but we're also moving product from the market by putting land into conservation. Fast forward, what you slowly see is the, the, those removals, those interlocking balances to now the, the caps are removed so you can get a ton of money. And I mean, even the conservation programs themselves have been corrupted. I mean, you can build one of these hog manure lagoons and get money under the notion of conservation. So that's where we get with the Wall Street model is it pushes everyone to do that. And what that does is it makes grains relatively cheaper than fresh produce. So I talk about too in that chapter of this was really contributed to the obesity crisis in America where we framed it for the longest time as a personal thing where it's really structural, where you almost need money to be healthy in America. And like that's honestly my fear right now with all these conversations over these diet drugs, Ozempic, is it'll just further intensify the class stratification of the food system in America. Because so many reform efforts um, these last few decades have been rooted in improving the food quality for those who shop at Whole Foods. My goal is to improve the food quality for those who go to Dollar General. But also, it's really, I, I, I just can't get over this. I think it's, it's hard, it's really, really hard to talk about the obesity crisis in America um, because it's such a, you know, such a personal thing. But we've never in the history of mankind before had the lower classes be the overweight classes. Historically, it was always the rich. And so to me, it's a, it's a really f- complex subject to unpack, but you realize how structural it really is. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and the grocery baron that you write about, namely Walmart, which sells about one third of all groceries bought in the United States. I mean, that chapter, that made me want to scream. I mean, they pay (laughs) wages so low that their employees have to get taxpayer funded subsidies just to live. I mean, they need to get Section 8 housing, they need to get Medicaid, you know, that that kind of thing. And then the Walmart billionaire family, which isn't paying health insurance and isn't paying living wages, is not only building art museums with the most expensive art in the world, but a medical school where people can go to cure the diseases brought about by the unhealthy food that they're selling at Walmart. That was a wild chapter to write. That originally wasn't in this book proposal. I was going to do Publix because... As naive as this sounds, I didn't think of Walmart as a grocery store. Yeah. And I've been to Walmart tons of times. But you start looking at the data, not only, you know, like, as you said, they sell one in three groceries in America. Their market share is the same as the second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, and seventh combined. And in many parts of middle America, like, like the Wichita's of America, they have like a 75% market share. It's not just grocery, though. I mean, I spent a lot of time going um, in Texas because Walmart's building these healthcare clinics inside their stores. Basically, for all the red states that didn't expand Medicaid. And what you realize is, oh, this richest family in the world, their goal is to capture every dollar of America's underclass. Because you have your pharmacy, you have your tires, you have your, you're going to have your health care soon, you're going to have your groceries, you're going to, they're, they're testing out veterinary clinics. It is, it is a level of power we've never seen before in the food system. And this is a little intellectual, but in my head, I kept comparing it to like the closest thing we've ever seen in America to like, um, what do you call those things in Soviet Union? The a Politburo. Yeah. Like the the because I, I just had this one vendor tell me with Walmart it's supply and command because the the power dynamics are so unequal with Walmart. I mean, even this blew my mind researching Walmart was Walmart has a rule as a vendor to Walmart no more than thirty percent of your sales can come from Walmart. 
And Walmart has that rule. And I couldn't get understand that. I had to ask some people in the grocery industry why. Wait a minute. So if I'm selling, you know, beans, so what does that mean? Like I'm a vendor, I'm selling Walmart beans. I can only sell 30% of my total beans to Walmart? Yep. And I have to prove that to them. Yes. And they publish, I found in examples of them publishing lists where they shame. For example, I have a, I talk about, there's a peanut butter company that sells 50% of peanut butter in America. Walmart named them publicly for like being over that limit. Why did they do that? Uh, because someone in the grocery industry told me it's for supply chain risk management. Walmart realizes it's such a vulture that you need to get at least 70% of your income from other sources because Walmart is such a loss or at cost client for most most of their suppliers so they basically want you on the edge but they want to push you over oh i see so they basically they want to strip mine you they want to they want to exploit you but they also want you to live so you have to have other clients who aren't exploiting you yes they want you on life support that's i mean and the other thing that was really shocking to read was that if you are supplying walmart product you either have to improve the product or the product has to be cheaper every year. Yeah. And that was a little thing I, I stumbled on where just personally, I like going to estate sales now just because I think most most crap is it's so poorly, the quality is so garbage anymore. And you, you realize just how intentional this was with Walmart. It's, they call it the plus one. Either you, you, know, you improve quality or you have to lower the cost. No matter what the inflation rate is in any given year. Yep. Yep. And so what this does is, I mean, it pushes you offshore. It pushes you to have 12-year-olds pick berries. It pushes you to have undocumented people do all your labor. I mean, it's, it's a race to the bottom. And with the power asymmetry the way it is, Walmart, basically Walmart sets the tone for everyone else. So we could go on for many hours talking about all of this, and we haven't even talked in detail about the anti-union practices of some of these barons and the labor practices and so on. And I think that you should make a many-part Netflix, a seven-part Netflix series out of this book. But I think, and especially because, you know, Down to Earth is a podcast about hope and about solutions, let's talk about some of those solutions. And there are so many that you write about and talk about, and they're really interesting. First of all, a robust antitrust movement. I mean, this is all about policy. This is all about breaking up monopolies. What would that look like in the food sector? So you're starting to see it already. I mean, you're seeing it in, at the Federal Trade Commission. Uh, President Biden appointed a young woman named Leah Khan to chair of the FTC. I mean, she is single-handedly bringing all these cases against big tech. She's the one that just stopped the Kroger-Albertson merger, grocery store merger. And keep in mind, she's fascinating is, I mean, I got into a lot of this stuff because of her. I met her back in 2015 when I was at the Department of Treasury. I was a tax economist and I wrote a paper on why are we seeing the growth of monopoly level profits, especially in the agriculture sector. And before she went to law school, she was actually a journalist and wrote about chicken monopolies. <laughs> Uh, she wrote actually about how Secretary Vilsack failed to do anything under the first Obama administration on chicken, on meat monopolies. But she got me into this antitrust reform movement and her appointment's huge. I mean, it is, she's like the cool, the closest thing we've seen to a rock star in the academic setting in a long time. She's re-shifting how we think of monopoly in America. The problem is here is USDA has a carve out of antitrust authority from meatpacking. I actually argue at this point, we should strip that authority from USDA. I, I'm kind of of the mind that we should have a conversation about stripping USDA for parts. Because at this point, it's pretty clear it's just a cheerleader for big ag. I would put that authority over into the FTC and honestly encourage this growing antitrust movement. Because what I love about it is it's also bipartisan, especially the meatpacking stuff. Yeah, you wrote an article and placed it in a conservative magazine specifically because you wanted to show that this antitrust is really something that covers, I mean, pretty much everybody except the monopolists themselves would benefit from antitrust. I'm so glad you mentioned that. Yes, uh, part of this book originated in an article I wrote in the American Conservative, maybe like five, six years ago. Um, a lot of these ideas I've been kind of testing out. And that, I mean, that's, that's personally what I gravitate towards now. It's where's some, where's some unique spot that you could build a fun coalition together? Because it's, I'm so sick of the same old, same old. I mean, we know the food system's not working. I mean, it's either 
any American that goes abroad, one of the first things they always say, it's cheaper and better abroad, the food. And you can just kind of look around and tell. The, the new uh, USDA egg census came out last week and it confirmed everything. I mean, farms are only consolidating. Less young people are entering the farming profession and the current trends are just getting worse. So people want something different. Okay, so one of those things would be to reform the USDA and put the antitrust component in the um, Federal Trade Commission, put the food stamps and and SNAP in the um, Health and Human Services. You know, in under your vision, what would the USDA actually do? Uh, <laughs> not a lot. Uh, I, I mean, part of this I say, and I say this as someone who used to work in a department, Nothing scares a D.C. bureaucracy more than the threat of losing its power and its budget and its agency. And so even just stripping, even if it's just antitrust authority and SNAP, first of all, SNAP is huge. Yeah. We talk about the farm bill. Food assistance is 75% of it. Right. You take that away and put that under HHS, that is a lot of stuff at USDA. I'm just a fan of, also, like, keep in mind, the USDA structure dates back to the Civil War. <laughs> that's, not, that's not the same America we're living in. So... That's part of it. It's just sometimes you just need to scare an agency into doing the right thing because the underappreciated thing of USDA right now is it's just it's such a calcified organization. There's no original thinking. Also, no, it's really hard for them to hire because a lot of people don't a lot of young people don't want to go work for an agency that's basically in the hand of industry. Another thing that you write about as a potential solution is have a farm bill that rewards stewardship. So people get paid for conservation and regenerative practices instead of um, subsidies to industry for making essentially junk food and food for livestock. Yeah, I mean, that's I think there actually is a unique bipartisan coalition here, too, where I mean, the current farm bill is the status quo farm bill. The Republican Party itself is at war over it because it's getting so expensive and it's so bloated. I think you could basically take the current farm bill as is, and I'm not talking about the food assistance stuff, just the farm programs, take all that money and just put it into those conservation stewardship practices. I just think crop insurance, these subsidy programs have just gone way off kelter, that it's time to just kind of junk the farm bill as we know it and move to this more regenerative model where we reward financially reward practices that we know is good. It's good farming and good for the land. Another solution that you talk about is putting animals back on the land and phasing out factory farming altogether. What land would you put them back on? I mean, would it be on the land that's now being grown for their feed? So this was once personally my favorite. I actually think is most likely because of um, EVs. The single largest use of corn, corn right now in America is ethanol. And that market's going to collapse fast. Because of electric vehicles. Yep. Cars are going to move to electric vehicles, hybrid or what have you. They're just not going to use as much ethanol as they need. And you can have all that surplus land in the Corn Belt come available. And what a great way to pivot from, you know, you can slowly phase out the use of these metal sheds. And then as this land's no longer needed for ethanol production, you phase it into back into animal production. I mean, it's such an aha thing going on right now, but also it's such a, talk about like a rural jobs program. You can have one man doing 5 million hogs that are largely automated, or you can have a bunch of family farms doing pasture, meat, and dairy. So basically, as you break up monopolies, you break up the land and somehow subdivide it among people who can rebuild the family farm structure in a place like Iowa? Yes, but I wouldn't. I would be careful. I mean, the land stuff, there hasn't actually been that much as massive land consolidation in the Midwest as I originally thought, because I mean, farmland's going for like 25,000 an acre right now. The biggest problem we have in the Midwest is like, for example, in Iowa, most farmland's owned by non-Iowans. Grandma and grandpa die, kids move to Long Beach, they put into a trust and it's just, it's passive income. I think in order to get those uh, regenerative farming dollars, you have to farm your land. It can't just be some passive investment property. Because I, I will tell you, anyone driving the Midwest, you can always tell rented land because it, that land's always treated abysmally. It's the land that's always farmed right up to the creek because, you know, person living in Long Beach, they don't know anything about farming. They don't really care as long as they get a paycheck. I mean, land will always be used for what's most economical. I mean, it's put into ethanol production right now because that's where most of the subsidies are going to. But if we move to a system where we financially incentivize pasture production, land will transition into pasture. I mean, that is a key point I learned in writing this book is there's no free market in the food system. Everything you eat is subsidized. The question is over to what degree. 
Another idea which which you have, which I love, is engaging institutional buyers of food, like schools, hospitals, maybe nursing homes, prisons, things like that, for procurement of healthy local food. And this can be done on a state and local level, as well as if there are probably more than on a federal level. Yeah, this one, you can you don't have to wait around for D.C. to do the right thing. This is this one's huge, especially for the local farmers, because you talk to any of them privately at the farmer's market. You know, a lot of them aren't the biggest fan of it just because it's not consistent income. You can get rained out or what have you. You get that contract from your local university to you know sell an X amount of carrots each week. That's such a stabilizing mechanism for them. And it's it's really also keeping those community dollars within the community. You know, it's also like just good politics. I mean, who doesn't want your local kids eating local food instead of, you know, beef from the Brazilian rainforest? It's also potentially a transition to healthier food, which addresses public health and possibly even behavioral problems in schools. Yes. I mean, that is, I don't touch on this as much in the book because this is just not my forte. But there's a lot of new evidence coming along about the impacts this food is like our, this junk food's having on our bodies. And even something simple as a lot of the trauma these animals feel in these industrial facilities, what it does to them and what it does to us when we consume them. I mean, pigs are pumped full of antibiotics just basically as a growth hormone. And turns out if you're eating a growth hormone, I think it's not that big of a, a leap to think, oh, you're going to put on those weight gainers too. I mean, there, there's just all this weird... A dark production model does dark things to you, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, and we've talked a number of times about how food that is, for example, beef that is grown on pasture, grass-fed, grass-finished, regeneratively produced beef, it's a different food than CAFO beef. It has more omegas, and it's just a lot healthier for you. I'm smiling because you reminded me, one of my favorite stories from our, our wedding two years ago was... Our big rule was we only did Iowa-grown food and only pasture meat and dairy. And my mom's one of 12, big Irish Catholic. And I couldn't get over how much, how many of my Iowa family members couldn't get over how good our pork was because we had pasture pork. And it's just like they they were so used to industrial pork chops. And that yeah. stuff just, isn't, just doesn't taste good. I love that little antidote because it's also... Like, like I was saying earlier, so much of this model is just is devoid of flavor, devoid of taste. I mean, that is... A key takeaway I have for your listeners is the system we have now is radical. All the reforms we're talking about actually are very traditional and like kind of common sense. I mean, it is radical that one man does five million hogs. Right. And it seems kind of common sense and normal to have lots of people making a decent living as a, I mean, it's, you know, it's, we're talking about versions of a kind of medieval serfdom if not slavery or indentured servitude. That is, a lot of these industrial, especially in the dairy model, a lot of these industrial dairy operations are basically feudal lords. It's mostly undocumented men that work in these facilities. This American Life has reported, you know, they'll put 12 undocumented workers to a two-bedroom house. So they're both their employer and also their landlord. On top of it, they're usually the largest employer in these counties. Like, there's just a whole layer of feudalism going on here that's underappreciated and really hard to report because it's just these workers don't want to shake shake things up. They're just trying to survive, and so a lot of these stories just go. They're just hidden. They're below the surface. Yeah, but then when people start actually asking them and giving them room to talk, they burst into tears because it's so bad, and they have so many not only terrible working conditions, but chronic illnesses and pain that they're not allowed to, that they can't get treated. Oh, I mean, that is, I listened to a, someone speak a few years ago, talked about how, you know, a lot of these workers see a lot of trauma all day, especially in like these hog facilities. And it's really hard for them to like deal with trauma at work all day and then come home and not continue on that trauma. Yeah. I mean, it's, and then like just on the flip side, I, I just go back to like, I've seen what it, the system used to be and what it could be again of just like, oh, here's like a normal hog farm with, you know, a bunch of hogs running around, 40 dairy cows. I mean, it's even, this is even a weird analogy to make. I compare it to like a retirement account. The problem now with these models is you put all your eggs in one basket. No one would do that for your retirement. You diversify. I mean, a lot of family farms used to have multiple, you know, lines of business. You have 
what's the joke? What they call the hogs? They used to call hogs in Iowa the mortgage lifters. You know, it's you spread your assets around, and this model makes everything incredibly fragile because it pushes everyone to do one thing, and if that one thing doesn't go well, for example, a lot of these animals are so genetically similar that you know disease goes through them real quick, then you know the whole system falls apart. Gee, we didn't learn from the Irish potato famine. I know. And I say that as an Irish Catholic. Yeah. Well, and one of the things that I think is important to talk about, too, is, okay, let's say that we pass laws and enforce laws. I mean, enforcement is such a huge piece of what often doesn't happen. I mean, I I had a journalist on one time who said, I asked her, what was the what's the best thing we could do for American agriculture to push it toward regenerative farming? And she said, enforce the laws we already have. Anyway, but, you know, let's say we were to improve working conditions and pay and benefits for farm workers. Right now, when you do that, they push those jobs overseas. Yeah, that that's an underappreciated thing with this whole free trade. I mean, free trade's kind of just, first of all, it's not free trade. Right. Uh, there's massive subsidies going on to, into the system. But all that means is just it's a race to the bottom in terms of labor. So who's willing to abuse their labor the most? We'll get that's where the, the production chains will go. I really agree with that journalist you had on that said about enforcing the rules. But it's also like the one that's like given me hope in a lot of this work is a lot, most of the people fighting back tend to be older women in these rural communities who are the ones speaking truth to power. I mean, they're the ones that the biggest fighters against confinements tend to be those older women. They're the ones that will show, I mean, a lot of times these, these facilities, they're breaking water regulations, they're breaking labor stuff. They're the ones that are usually, you know, highlighting them saying, hey, this is illegal or this is not right or your numbers don't add up here. A lot of these state agencies are so broken anymore, they're not really doing their job. And so that is something I always tell people is say something to a journalist. I mean, so many journalists are moving a mile a minute. They're not being paid that much. You know, it's up to you to bring attention to these issues. Like if you see something, I mean, that some of the best stuff in my hog chapter comes from people in Iowa saying, that's not right. Or you should look over here. Or that, you know, that don't, you know, that kind of stuff. If you see something, say something. Yeah, I literally was going to say that. I was trying to like <laughs> think of a better way to phrase that. No, in my head. Yeah. But like even, this is the example, this is such a radical example. I think about all the time is, Outside of Council Bluffs, Iowa, like two years ago, some CAFO operator was literally taking... So let me back up. 10% of hogs in these facilities don't make it. So usually outside of all of them are these dumpsters just full of dead pig bodies. It's awful. You'll see vultures, all that kind of stuff. What this hog guy, hog confinement guy was doing in Western Iowa was taking a mulch grinder, (laughs) mulching his dead hogs and throwing them out on his field. And this older woman noticed one day driving, she was seeing literally like pig legs and... Um, stuff on, in the fields that's illegal <laughs> right and it was like her activism of speaking up first of all she went to the state agency they didn't do anything went to reporters and eventually it was the the public outcry that got something done where it's just like you can't this isn't fargo you know what i mean this is not that movie <laughs> yeah yeah sorry that's such a radical example but it's like it's one woman driving saying that's not right I'm going to say something. And that's how you stop that kind of behavior. Yeah. And it's so scary now because, I mean, you talked about private equity buying companies and stripping them for parts. And one of the industries that they've been strip mining is journalism itself. So private equity has bought a lot of midsize and small and even large city newspapers and basically, you know, reduced them to barely functional institutions sold off their real estate, had people, you know, a much smaller reporting force working from home. I mean, it's it's a disaster. And that's why it's hard. You know, let's see somebody sees something and they say something. There's not as many reporters to, to say it to. No, I mean, that is I was able to write this book because of those reporters. I mean, the Des Moines Register used to have have the best agriculture section in America. They had a whole section of agriculture news, a whole team of reporters. And I'm able to tell the story about the hog baron because I'm able to go back and look at their work through the archives, you know, follow down leads. And the thing about this moment we're living in now is these barons create their own reality. I have Google alerts on them all. Trust me, I see all their, uh, there's certain news outlets that exist out there just to copy and paste their press releases of like my hog baron loves giving away free pork chops. You know, it's, um, I don't want to undersell the darkness of this moment, but you can't let that overcome you. 
That's what they want. That's when they win. Right. So I'm just a believer in, he's got to keep chugging. At some point, I'm just a big believer. These things always run themselves into the ground. This model is not economical. The dirty secret even for these barons is they hollowed out their voter base. I mean, rural America doesn't have the votes like it used to. I mean, when you used to have a dozen farm families on the street and now there's two, it's a lot, you know, you, you lose your votes. In places like Iowa, the dirty secret is the largest industry in Iowa now is insurance. It's not agriculture. Interesting. Well, so, okay, there's two more solutions that I've found that, that I've heard you talk about or write about. One was call your attorney general's office and tell them to employ more antitrust lawyers and tell them why. That's something that, that people can do. And then another one was there's this government document that I'd never even heard of. It's called the Plum Book, Plum Like the Fruit. Well, tell us what, what that is and how it can be used as a solution to make agriculture a better space. Yeah, this one is especially for anyone listening who's part of an organization or works for an organization. This is so huge is the government printing office puts out a book called every presidential cycle called the Plum Book. And basically what it does is it lists every single <laughs> political appointee. And we're talking thousands. And USDA actually has a lot because it has state directors, all that kind of stuff. What I realized in the last transition was a lot of groups were putting together a list of, oh, here's who we want in Treasury. You know, it's that whole kind of insider DC game. But no one was putting together a USDA list. You know, who's going to run the food assistance programs? I mean, that that's a ton of money or even the research arm. There's an undersecretary for, sorry, they reorganized them a few years ago, so I don't quite remember exactly who is who. But there's one that basically oversees research for USDA. Who that person is is huge. That determines how billions of dollars is used for research. Are we going to research regenerative agriculture or are we going to research a bunch of BS stuff related to, to uh, industrial animal production facilities? I mean, that is huge. That's what I learned from that big tech antitrust reform movement success. The appointment of Commissioner Khan didn't happen overnight. You know, politicians don't do things for the good. I mean, you kind of have to force them to do the right thing. You have to give them a political reward for doing something good. So there's a lot of work that went into getting Lena's appointment to the FTC. And the same thing with the USDA is I'm a big believer. Industry will never give reformers a seat at the table. you got to fight for it. And so re- people listening should really demand or the organizations are part of, you should be putting your list together. Who would be interested in serving in D.C.? Who would be interested in being state director for our state? Because if you don't, trust me, industry is. They will put together some dairy lobbyists to run you know, the program in New Mexico or what have you. I just think that's such a low-hanging fruit that has so much power that's underappreciated. Right. And that's why I really push people to think about it. Because it's, for example, going back to the meat regulation, um, there's a little agency in uh, USA called GIPSA. That's what oversees meat regulation. Whoever is politically appointed to that can carry out those rules. And is it going to be a person-friendly in the industry or a person who's actually going to do reform? That's a big question. We've barely talked about meat packing, and there's an incredible chapter in your book about this a Brazilian company that is engaged in corruption so deep and in every kind of bad practice in terms of ecology, climate, animal welfare, economics, labor, I mean, the whole thing. And then here are these American ranchers, many of whom are put into a kind of place of indentured servitude where these big meat packing companies set the prices that they pay for their animals. Do you think there are ways to disrupt these monopolies, like in the way that cell phones disrupted the landline industry? Nobody really saw it coming, and all of a sudden landlines were a thing of the past pretty much. Like in meat, you know, direct to consumer or cooperatives or other structures like that. Um... Yeah, but to me, I'm a big believer in there's never usually a silver bullet. It takes a multi-pronged approach. In order to allow those models, you have to keep in mind, industry will never, they're never going to lose market share, especially a company like JBS, which I would argue is the closest thing we've ever had to a criminal organization as a modern day corporation. They're ruthless. And so the second you look like you're getting success, trust me, they will they will make sure it doesn't, success doesn't come. So part of it is, I mean, my big undercurrent of that chapter is a failure of Secretary Belsack. To be blunt, this company became a monopolist through bribery. It bribed over 1,800 politicians in Brazil to get a bunch of cheap money to buy a bunch of companies in America. And not only were they allowed to keep their monopoly, I mean, USDA still gives them contracts. And Vilsack said, literally in a letter a year or two ago, it's because they're too big. (laughs) 
they're no to me. I compare that they're just uh, like a school bully. They're going to keep pushing the envelope until they actually have consequences. And yeah. I blame Vilsack for not reining them in. That said, for me, packing, I'm a really big believer in bright line rules. What I mean by that is the simpler the rule, the better. Because the second anything is kind of gray, that's where lawyers make their money and they push the envelope. But like a simple thing of like a packer ban, it's where you can't slaughter the animal you own. Like Iowa has that rule in its books, but we don't enforce it because of some, some deal with Smithfield. But like a federal packer ban would essentially break up a lot of the meat companies in America. Because like, for example, Smithfield, which is owned by the WH Group of China, they're not only are they the largest hog butcher in America, they own the most hogs. They own like one in four, one in five. And a packer ban would essentially break them up into two different companies. I'm also a fan of limiting companies over a certain market size to only one line of protein. If you do more than X amount of milk units, you can only, if you do chicken, you can't do beef. These are competition protection guardrails the way I look at it. And by putting these in place, you allow these other models a chance to compete in the marketplace. And maybe, maybe that's where things move to, but we will never know until we take that first step to kind of rein in these, these barons because they're going to, like, kind of like AT, AT&T did for the longest time, it stifled out innovation. That's what monopolists do is they stifle innovation because they just want to keep reaping in the profits. Something I wonder about, I mean, you were talking about diversification and retirement plans before, but I really do, I mean, you didn't talk about this in the book, but I wonder about the role of retirement plans and institutional investors in maintaining a status quo. In theory, you know, the people who are investing who've got their 401k or their IRAs or whatever, like me, like maybe you, you know, don't like monopolies, but in practice, they don't want anything to change. They want to make a little more money every year. And so many people are invested in them, not just billionaires, but everyone who has any kind of retirement plan. Do you think those folks are kind of like, or that mentality of, I don't want any change is is instrumental in keeping things the way they are? I'm trying to think how to phrase this. This book is, it's been really interesting to see how people perceive this book. There's a generational divide with this book. My experience from the reviews we've gotten is older Americans in richer cities don't understand the critiques of the system. So if I live in suburban LA, my home is worth like a million dollars, my suburban home. I have a decent food, you know, I go to Whole Foods or whatever. My retirement portfolio looks great. Why would I really want to change things? That's very different than, you know, the child of a slaughterhouse worker, millennial in Ottumwa, Iowa. That's why I'm very conscious of not coming off radical, even though I know industry will paint me as a radical, is... As you paint them as a radical. Yeah, I, I mean, that's my goal. Is, I yeah. mean, I love playing with rhetoric for that reason, is how do I convince that person, that older American in suburban LA, that the system's not working, we need to change it, because the system works for them. It works for them as long as they want to be naive to the system, as long as they want to ignore the one in 10 Americans that work in the food system, how they're exploited, the farm workers, all that kind of stuff. And it's hard. I mean, it's easy to be ignorant to that to some degree with the state of the American media of how, you know, it just doesn't have the resources it used to. So these stories are getting harder and harder to tell. That's a really interesting question you asked. It's something I'm very conscious of. I mean, that's, that's why I wear a blue button up. Sure, every time I give a talk is I understand in order to create a reform movement, you got to pull together a coalition. And part of building, pulling together a coalition is you got to meet different people where they're at and kind of show them how all of us coming together can make a better system for all. Well, and there's so much potential for bipartisan work in what you're saying. I mean, the Kivira Coalition calls it the radical center. I don't know if you've heard that term, but it's basically, you know, it, it originated when some environmentalists and ranchers came together and realized that they had 80% of their ideas in common. And so they decided to throw out the 10% on each extreme and work in that radical center where they where they agreed, which was almost everything. And, you know, as you said, I mean, Democrats and Republicans, people of all political stripes can get on board with this stuff. And it does raise the question of how to really talk about this in a way that Red America can understand, because right now Red America is voting against their interests where a lot of these issues are concerned. I'm always hesitant with that 
I look at everything in terms of like a Midwest Iowa lens. Red America in the day is really, Trump's America is really just rooted in the South. And that's a whole different conversation. But what I really care about is what are those Midwestern communities that used to be purple, that used to be blue, that are now red? And these are the communities that really got the short end of the stick under, under neoliberalism. Obama won most rural counties in Iowa. <laughs> I mean, that's what's wild is this wasn't that long ago. It's not like people got, I'm gonna be careful with my words here. And I talk about this with my coffee chapter. I mean, let me, let's, let's, um, let me get frank here, is you saw the consolidation in the agricultural space, but you also saw a lot of these manufacturing towns just basically we offshored our manufacturing supply chain to what I would argue is a modern day fascist country that is China. I mean, you have a strong man consolidating power over there and they're going through a property bubble that's worse than our housing crash. A big part of my, my uh, coffee chapter is about the relationship between monopolists and fascism. The coffee baron I talk about, it's a secret German family. Their money, they used to be in the chemical industry. They were very close to the, the Nazi regime. They were early supporters of Hitler. They drank the Kool-Aid. Turns out it was economically very beneficial for them. You know, I, I talk about how, you know, the family, after its dark history came to light a few years ago, they commissioned a big report documenting their use of slave labor, all this kind of stuff. And they promised not, you know, they made charity contributions and they promised not to do this again. But right before I went to press, I had to open that chapter back up because the Wall Street Journal reported the family still sells coffee in Russia. So don't tell me you learned your lesson when, what is Russia? I mean, it's dictator, fascist, pick your word here. It's greed. It's greed. I mean, that, that is like why I generally always, I mean, it to me, one of the hallmarks of America is our avoidance of concentration of power. I mean, the way our democracy is structured as we try to avoid, it's structured to avoid concentrations of power. That is like, to me, my big fear at this moment is concentrations of economic power corrupt the political system in ways that you never really know where they're going to go, but it's not good for a democracy. Well, and that's something I meant to ask you about earlier. I mean, we, it's, it's, uh, you know, we come from a tradition where our founding fathers were quite skeptical of corporate power. And right now it seems like almost nobody I mean, maybe Bernie Sanders, but, you know, very few people are really grappling with the nature of power and how imbalanced it is in our country right now, which may be because of the campaign finance system or whatever. But one of the things that you talk about is we really have to talk frankly about power. Yeah, to me, it's kind of by industry. I mean, every politician kind of picks their battles. I mean, we have no campaign finance regulatory system anymore. I mentioned, you know, my hog baron writes a is the largest political donor in Iowa, or one of the largest political donors in Iowa, is because he needs, for his business model, he needs to capture the state of Iowa. And when you name names, you unleash a flood of money against you. I get it. That's why I go back to this plum book. Sometimes the politicians, they want to do the right thing, but they're scared. So they defer to executive agencies. And there's a lot of power in shaping markets in these executive agencies. I mean, like the appointment of Leah Khan, I go back again, that's a young woman challenging power. It is a wild thing to see. The Wall Street Journal has been after her. Like every other day, there's like an editorial page attacking her because here's a young woman of color just attacking the tech monopolies. And guess what? It's good politics. I mean, yeah. who, who doesn't like, who likes Facebook? <laughs> so it's, um, that's why I really push the plum book stuff is not every politician can, you know, live up to your ideals or be the best you want. But you get a few key people in these powerful positions, those are game changers. You get an undersecretary who cares about regenerative agriculture, you're shifting billions of dollars. Don't underestimate the power of that kind of stuff. Now, you ran for Congress in Iowa a few years ago, and you saw firsthand about how that works and, and what, what it's like <laughs> to be attacked. Yeah, I mean, everyone does something crazy. That was, I mean, I, I, that's why I say that. I mean, I, I'm shaped much by the experience. I never ended up putting my name on the ballot. But I really love that experience and that it showed me, I mean, I love the people side of it. I like talking to people. I like door knocking. I compare door knocking to like stand up comedy because you're testing your rhetoric, you're listening. That's why words care, matter a lot to me. Because like, if I knock on someone's door in Iowa and I say KFO, actually most people in Iowa don't know what a KFO is. In Iowa. In Iowa. I mean, that's such an industry term. I mean, people won't realize like what an acronym is. They just know those as the metal sheds. And honestly, what they care about most knocking doors is how bad the water is in Iowa because you know what? People want a boat on the weekends and stuff, and they know how bad the lakes are for fishing and stuff. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I, I, I did that. I tried. But to me, that, I mean, that goes back to why I really wanted a concrete solution a section at the end of this book is it's not enough to complain. And people are sick of it. People are sick of it. I mean, it's 
I mean, trust me, I can complain all day, but uh, people really crave not only solutions, but like a positive vision of what could be. To me, part of this was me writing this book was just getting my head around this stuff. I just felt like there was not a book out there that explained the farm bill to me. I kind of thought these robber barons were funny ways, like kind of fun story devices to tell these bigger stories. Part of it is, is just enough people throw rocks, eventually, you know, these walls crumble and, and a meaningful system can come into place. I don't know, call, call me a little na uh, naive and idealistic, but nothing, never, you never get to see the table without fighting for it. And I think part of that is, I mean, like, I'm here today, right? I mean, I got a book deal. I, I'm a first in my family to go to college. I never thought I'd be doing this kind of stuff. This is what I love. I got the opportunity. I'm very grateful for Island Press for it. And sometimes you just got to make do with do and make hay with hay. Austin Frerichs is author of the new book, Barons, Money, Power, and the Corruption of America's Food Industry. Thank you so much for being with us. This has been great. Yeah, thanks for having me on, Mary Charlotte. And if you want to find out more about Austin's work, go to austinfrerich.com, A-U-S-T-I-N-F-R-E-R-I-C-K. And we will link to that in the show notes. You've been listening to Down to Earth. We would love it if you would support this program, which you can do by going to patreon.com slash down to earth planet to plate, where you can sign up for as little as $3. Patreon is P-A-T-R-E-O-N. And also please rate and review the podcast on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. The Kivira Coalition is a not-for-profit and a community network of ranchers, farmers, conservationists, scientists, educators, and many others dedicated to regenerative practices that produce healthy food, support meaningful livelihoods, sustain biodiversity, and remedy the impacts of climate change. To learn more about Kivira and how you can support their work, visit kiviracoalition.org, Q-U-I-V-I-R-A. And finally, this show is a production with the Radio Cafe. You can check out radiocafe.org to hear back episodes of this show and also find all kinds of other shows on a wide variety of topics as well. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time.